God's mercy. Amen, amen. Thank you. We want to get in the Word now. And so if you are watching, which you are, I want to invite you to take your Bibles and go with me to the book of Esther. And we're going to the book of Esther, and we're going to Esther chapter 4, verse number 13. Esther chapter 4, verse number 13, verse number 14. Esther chapter 4, verses 13 and 14, just two verses of Scripture. We're going to read them now, and I will read it in your hearing. The Word of God says, Then Mordecai commanded to answer Esther, Think not with thyself, that thou shalt escape in the king's house more than all the Jews. Verse 14. For if thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time, then shall their enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. For thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed. And who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this. And that's what we'll tag this sermon today. For such a time as this. We're praying, God, we thank you. We're grateful for the music that has inspired us today and the reminder that we must praise you for your grace and your mercy. We thank you for the conversation we've had today with our special guests. We thank you for all that has been said and done, our worship and giving, our worship and prayer. But Lord, we need a word from you right now. So speak. Speak to your people. Speak through the computer airwaves. Speak through the internet. Speak through smartphones. Speak through the television broadcasts. May your people not see me, but see thee living and working through me. Forgive me of my sins. And Lord, as we always say, when we get to the appeal, when we get to the appeal, just Lord, show up and show out. Show up and show out and prick someone's heart today. That they might surrender and give their life to you. Not I, but Christ. Be seen, be felt, be heard. We praise you and we thank you. Begging for forgiveness of sin. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. For such a time as this. Many people read the Bible, and when they read the Bible, they read the stories of amazing men. Noah and Moses. Abraham and Isaac. Jacob and Joseph, Elijah and Elisha, David and Solomon, Peter, James, and John, the Apostle Paul, and Jesus the Christ himself. But today, let me be clear that the Bible also has lots of stories of incredible women, too. I wish I had a witness in this place. Strong and brave women who led armies and challenged kings. Prophetic women who heard and obeyed the voice of God. Wise women who made difficult decisions and led the people back to God. Loyal women who stayed faithful to God even when their situations seemed perilous. Women who did the right thing no matter what anyone else did, but changed the course of history forever. And so on this Sabbath, let me begin by saying, don't forget the women. Don't think that we made it where we are as men, as a church, as a community, as a people without women. Show me a Franklin Delano Roosevelt, and I'll show you an Anne Eleanor Roosevelt. Show me a Bill Clinton, and I'll show you a Hillary Clinton. Show me a Warren Christopher, and I'll show you a Madeleine Albright. Show me a John Roberts, and I'll show you a Sonia Sotomayor. Show me a Chuck Schumer, and I'll show you an Elizabeth Warren. Show me a Jeff Bezos, and I'll show you a Mackenzie Scott. Show me a Ted Wilson, 
and I'll show you a Sandra Roberts. Show me a John Bradshaw, and I'll show you an Elizabeth Talbot. And it's not just our cousins, but we've got some strong black women too. Show me a Barack Obama, and I'll show you a Michelle Obama. Show me a Colin Powell, and I'll show you a Kamala Harris. Show me a Martin Luther King, and I'll show you a Harriet Tubman. Show me a Hakeem Jeffries, and I'll show you a Sheila Jackson Lee. Show me a Stephen Reed, and I'll show you a Keisha Lance Bottoms. Show me a Raphael Warnock, and I'll show you a Stacey Abrams. Show me a Robert Smith, and I'll show you an Oprah Winfrey. Show me a Tyler Perry, and I'll show you a Shonda Rhimes. Show me a Billy D. Williams, and I'll show you a Cicely Tyson. Show me a Lester Holt, and I'll show you a Joy Reid. Show me a LeBron James, and I'll show you a Candace Parker. Show me an Alex Bryant, and I'll show you a Brenda Billingy. Show me a Seth Bardu, and I'll show you a Sonia Moxie Creighton. Show me a Vandion Griffith, and I'll show you a Kimberly Mann. Show me a Leslie Pollard, and I'll show you a Prudence Pollard. Show me a Carlton Bird. And I'll show you a Danielle Bird. Don't get it twisted. Women are more than just child bearers, child nurturers, food preparers, or homemakers. Women are leaders, preachers, teachers, presidents, professors, doctors, dentists, accountants, attorneys, judges, pharmacists, senators, congresswomen, mayors, mothers, and wives all wrapped up in one. In my profession, we've got a lot of people who want to limit the calling and anointing on women. But if God has called them to preach, let them preach. If God has called them to pastor, let them pastor. Joel 2.28 says, and it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out all my spirit on all flesh, not some flesh, but all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. Praise God for women. I said praise God for women today because women play a vital role in Scripture as well. All throughout history, God has placed women in specific places for such a time as this. One example of this is Esther, Queen Esther. Now it's interesting, my friends, that out of all the 66 books in the Bible, only two, Esther and Ruth, are named after women. But somebody knows it's not always about the quantity. It's about the quality. I wish I had somebody in this place. So while there are only two books named after women in the Bible, women are all throughout the Bible. I want to be clear with any biblical misogynists out there that just because only two biblical books are named after women doesn't mean that women are to be less than or inferior to men. Because in the Bible, there are two books, Esther and Song of Solomon, that never mention the name of God in them. But that doesn't mean that God is less than or inferior just because the name of God is not mentioned in Esther or Song of Solomon. Nor does it mean that God is not all throughout these books. Because if you read the book of Esther carefully, in the book of Esther, any reader with some level of discernment, comprehension, and understanding recognizes that God is the main character in this book. In fact, in the book of Esther, God is putting himself on display even though he is unnamed. Read Esther. Yes, the book tells Esther's story, but the book is about God. God's awesome power. God's miraculous movements. 
God's mind-blowing mercy, God's divine deliverance, God's astounding actions. Don't get it twisted today. The book of Esther is about God. But to understand this book about God, you have to first understand the context surrounding Esther's story. As lovers of prophecy, a prophetic church we are, you will remember the great image King Nebuchadnezzar saw in Daniel chapter 2. The head was of gold. The breasts and arms were of silver. The belly and thighs were of brass. The legs were of iron. And the feet were a mix of iron and clay. Each metal, you will remember, represented a different kingdom that would rule the world at a specific time. The head of gold represented Babylon. The breasts and arms of silver represented Medo-Persia. The belly and thighs represented Greece. The leg of iron represented Rome. And the feet of iron and clay represented the ten divided kingdoms of the earth. The interpretation, you will remember, was that the world would be globally dominated first by Babylon, then by Medo-Persia, then by Greece, then by Rome, and then by the remaining 10 divided kingdoms. The context of the book of Esther begins during the time of dominance by Medo-Persia. Medo-Persia had conquered Babylon in roughly 538 BC. And they settled into domination of a world for a little over 200 years before they were replaced by the Greeks, who later were replaced, remember, by the Romans. Now, initially, the Medo-Persians under King Darius had conquered Greece back in 550 BC. But later, Darius's armies were defeated by Greece at the famous Battle of Marathon in 490 BC. Mad that he and his armies were defeated by the Greeks, History says that Darius was determined to get back at his Greek enemies. So what does he do? He's going to go back and make the Greeks pay for winning the battle at Marathon. That famous battle where a man ran 26 miles, which is where we get the distance of modern day marathons. I wish somebody would appreciate that history today. Hallelujah. Darius wants to get back at the Greeks. But before he's able to get back at the Greeks, history says he dies. And so his son, Xerxes, takes over. Xerxes, trying to finish what his daddy started, gets 250,000 Persians together to fight. They reach Athens in Greece. But the Greeks ultimately beat Xerxes and the Persians. Remember, this is in harmony with Daniel 2. Because just like the Persians defeated the Babylonians, the Greeks would ultimately defeat the Persians. Because remember, head of gold Babylon, breast and arms of silver Medo-Persia, and belly and thighs of brass Greece. Xerxes loses to the Greeks, so the Persian Empire is then defeated for good. Now, somebody's watching this here, Pastor Burr, what does all this have to do with Esther. I'm so glad you asked. Xerxes, the Persian king that I've been talking about, his name is Kase Arsa, Kase Arsa in Persian. In Hebrew, it's Akasev Ras. But in English, in English, it's Ahasuerus. And that's the name you'll find in the book of Esther, Ahasuerus. So Xerxes, Kasearsha, Akasav Rosh, and Ahasuerus are all the same person. So then the king in the book of Esther is Xerxes or Ahasuerus, Hasuerus, the son of Darius, who fought the Greeks and ultimately lost the Persian Empire to the Greeks. In Esther chapter 1, it begins by telling us of the massive kingdom of Ahasuerus. Several years into his reign, he calls a six-month strategic war planning summit in the capital city of Shushan. 
He does this because he's making preparations for the invasion of Greece. Because remember, he wants to get back at them. And he's confident at this summit that he's going to be victorious over the Greeks. He ends this six-month planning summit with a seven-day banquet. He plans to have an extravagant celebration with the best decorations, the best food, and the best dishes, but he also wants the best entertainment. And his version of the best entertainment is putting his wife at the time, Queen Vashti, on full display. He commands Queen Vashti to show up on the seventh day of the celebration and present herself. But Vashti tells her husband, the king, I'm not coming to your party. I'm not here to let my dignity and my class be compromised by walking in front of some intoxicated, perverted men. The king is furious. How dare she tell him, the king, her husband, what she's going to do? Because back in those days, women were to do as women were told. The king is livid. And he's concerned that his queen's actions would start a women's liberation movement. It's all in the Bible. Because if the queen got away with this kind of behavior, then every other woman in the empire would feel empowered to do the same. So what does the king do? He demotes her. She's no longer the queen. He then announces he's going to get a new queen. And he makes it clear that no one better disobey the king, not even the queen, or she will be replaced. Now, for four years, there's no queen. But the Bible says in Esther chapter 2 that the king's staff members tell him it's time to select a queen. They tell him to call all the beautiful young virgins of the land to come to Shushan, and after a period of time, let the young woman who pleases the king most become queen. The king liked this. Ahasuerus liked this, and, and he agrees to it. So all these women come to Shushan for a beauty competition, and there have to be thousands of women, women because remember, it was every mother's and father's dream for their daughter to be the queen, and it was every young lady's dream in the kingdom to become the queen. Now, in chapter 2 of Esther, we then learn of Mordecai and Esther. They're both Jews. They both live in Shushan. They're cousins, but Mordecai is about 15 years older than Esther. Esther's parents died when she was a little girl, which means it left her an orphan. So then Mordecai raises Esther as if she were his own daughter. Esther was beautiful, the Bible says, just gorgeous. She was noticed by the king's staff. So she was selected to be in the group that was, goes on to the next round of the competition that goes later to the king's palace to live so she can continue to participate in the beauty contest for, a, for the queen. Now, God's name is not mentioned in this book. And God's name is not mentioned yet in this story. But God is moving. History says that there were about 400 virgins who were taken to the palace and they were going to be there for a year working on themselves to look good as possible, to smell as good as possible, to use perfume, to use lotions, to use cosmetics, to enhance their skin, to enhance their hair. They were to be given special lessons on court etiquette. How you act when you're around royalty. How you talk when you're around royalty. How you walk when you're around royalty. And when the year was over, all of these 400 women would be presented to the king and he would make them his choice and one of them would be made queen. The day has come that it's Esther's turn. It's time for her to appear before the king. Esther walks before the king. Now, remember, the king has seen thousands of women, not just the 400 that made it to the next round, but he has seen thousands of women from all over the Persian Empire who wanted to be queen. It was just the final 400 who make it to the palace. The king sees Esther, and after he has seen Esther, 
he would never be the same again. He's wooed by her beauty, smitten by her charm, taken by her grace. She's fine, and she's the one. He selects Esther to be his queen. Now, I need you to understand, friends, what's going on here. Esther, a Jewish orphan, Esther, not a Persian, is elevated to the highest position that any woman could have in the entire world at that time. Again, God's name is not mentioned, but God is moving. Mordecai tells her to keep her Jewishness a secret. Because there was a lot of prejudice in the Persian Empire, just like there's a lot of prejudice in the world today. People mad in America because we have a black woman as the vice president of the United States. She hasn't done anything wrong. She hasn't been in her position even for two months. The only thing that's wrong for some people is she's the wrong color. But she can't do anything about that because God made her who she is. She's been made in the image of God, in the likeness of God. She's black. She's classy. She's charming. She's articulate. She's smart. She's beautiful. And she's a woman. Esther is Jewish. She's classy. She's charming. She's articulate. She's smart. She's beautiful. And she's a woman. Esther is crowned king, but because he's concerned about his cousin, who he has raised as his daughter, Mordecai hangs around the palace. Mordecai hangs around the palace because he's raised Esther as his child, and he doesn't want anybody messing with his child. I can relate. I have three daughters to talk about me, to mess with me, to mistreat me is one thing. But when you talk about my daughters, mess with my daughters, mistreat my daughters, we're going to have some problems. I wish I had a witness in this place. Mordecai hangs around the palace to get whatever word he can from Esther and about Esther. And while he's hanging around the palace, he learns that two of the king's doorkeepers, Big Fan and Teresh are their names, that they plan to assassinate the king. Because these were royal officials who guarded the king's private quarters, they had access to the king and could kill him, which reminds me, it's not always those on the outside you've got to watch, but sometimes it's the ones on the inside that you've got to keep your eyes on. I wish somebody knew what I was talking about. Remember, friends, on January 6th, the attack on the United States Capitol didn't come from the outside. It came from the inside. It wasn't international terrorist. It was domestic terrorist. It wasn't one political party trying to kill persons of the other political party. It was people in the same political party trying to kill one of their own in their own political party. I wish I had time. Mordecai hears a big van and Terrace's plan. He tells Esther. Esther tells the king. When the matter is investigated, it's true. Big Fan and Teresh are then hung on the gallows. Mordecai's actions are written in the royal record because loyalty needed to be rewarded just as much as disloyalty needed to be punished. Again, God's name's not mentioned, but God is moving. We're now in chapter 3. And we meet a man by the name of Haman. Haman is a Persian. Haman is on the king's staff. The king likes Haman, and Haman is elevated in the kingdom. But there's bad blood between Haman and Mordecai. Haman is an Agagite, and Mordecai is a Jew. And there's bad blood between the two, going back 1,000 years in their history to Israel's exile or exodus from Egypt. Somebody will remember that 
after Israel is delivered from Pharaoh's oppression, they're in the wilderness and they're attacked by the Amalekites. The Amalekites were descendants of Esau. And because the Amalekites attacked the Jews, God cursed the Amalekites and God's curse said that one day the Amalekites were going to be extinct. 400 years later, Saul conquered the Amalekites. Saul captured their king who was Agag. Saul was supposed to kill Agag, but he didn't do it. He let Agag live. And because Saul didn't kill Agag like he was told to do, Saul incurred the Lord's displeasure. And for that and many other things that Saul did that displeased the Lord, the throne was removed from Saul's family. So then the prophet Samuel stepped in. The Bible says that Samuel hacked Ahag, Agag to death in pieces hacked him to death in pieces. Haman was a descendant of Agag. Almost 1,000 years had passed since the curse. Hundreds of years had passed since the hacking of Agag. But Haman knew his family history. He knew it was a Jewish prophet, Samuel, who had hacked and killed his royal ancestor. Mordecai was a Jew. To make matters worse, Mordecai was a descendant of Kish. Kish was from the tribe of Benjamin. Benjamin was from the tribe or family in line of Saul. Both Haman and Mordecai knew their history. And so there was beef between the descendants of Saul and the descendants of Agag. And both Haman and Mordecai had not forgotten. Now, because of Haman standing in the royal palace, when he walked in, everybody bowed down. But Mordecai didn't bow. He didn't bow because he couldn't stand Haman. This made Haman's blood boil. So Haman then strategizes to kill not only Mordecai, but also Mordecai's people. Because if he just kills Mordecai, Mordecai's people, the Jews, would later come and kill him. So Haman goes to the, to the Persian astrologers and magicians and tells them to come up with a day where they can execute the genocide of the Jews. They give him a date. Haman then goes to the king and tells him that throughout the Persian empire, there are Jews who are a threat to his empire and they need to be destroyed. The king thinks it's a great idea and he gives Haman his seal stamp so Haman can authorize the genocide of all the Jews in the Persian empire. We're now at chapter 4. We're now where our text of scripture is. There's wailing and there's gnashing of teeth among the Jews that on a specific date, they're going to all be killed. Mordecai is upset. He tells Esther what's going on. He tells her, you've got to go to the king and you've got to plead for your people. But see, it's really not that simple. Because in Persia, nobody, including the, king, including the queen, went before the king without a personal invitation. In fact, anybody who went into the presence of the king without being invited could be killed on the spot. So Esther would not only be breaking royal protocol if she just went to the king without an invitation, but she would also be risking her life. And the only way her life or anyone else's life would be spared is if when she walked in, the king extended his golden scepter. Now, you need to understand this context. Esther was not only fearful because she hadn't been invited to see the king, but she hadn't been, the history says, invited to see the king in 30 days, which suggests then that the king was a player, that the king had must have seen many other women because he hadn't seen his wife 30 days, and I don't know how long a husband can go 30 days without seeing his wife. The king hadn't gotten around to seeing Esther for a month, and she didn't want to get to upset her husband because he's the same one who demoted Bastai for disobedience to his commands. But yet, her cousin, her dad, is telling her to go before the king. But does she listen 
to her cousin or does she listen to her family? Remember, the Bible says that she's supposed to leave and cleave from her family and be joined to her husband. But this is bigger than Mordecai and Ahasuerus. This is about God and Satan. This is about right and wrong. This is about truth versus error. Mordecai then recites our text in verse 13. Think not with thyself that thou shalt escape in the king's house more than all the Jews. For if thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time, then shall their enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. But thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed, and who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this. In other words, friends, what Mordecai is telling Esther is, don't think you'll escape in the king's palace any more than all the other Jews. You're dead if you do, and you're dead if you don't. Because they're going to find out that you're Jewish. And you're going to be dead if you don't do anything. If you remain silent, if you remain quiet, you better believe that relief and deliverance will come for the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house, you won't survive. But God has called you to this kingdom. God has called you to this moment for such a time as this. That's why when people are suffering, we can't be silent. That's why when people are suffering, we can't be quiet. We can't be complicit. We must speak for those who can't speak for themselves. We must fight for those who can't fight for themselves. We have, can't have that attitude, I've got mine, so you get yours. No. People are asking me all the time, why are you always speaking up so much for people? Why are you always speaking against racism? You better be quiet. You're going to forfeit your future. You've got a bright career, a bright future ahead of you. Just be quiet. Things will work themselves out. And the sad thing is, this is some of our people telling me this. But I tell them, God has called me to speak up. God has called me to help. So even if the corporate church doesn't go to Houston, I'm going to Houston. Even if the church doesn't go to Jackson, I'm going to Jackson. Even if the church does not march in downtown Huntsville, I'm going to march in Huntsville because the Lord has called me for such a time as this to speak up for what's right, to speak in, against injustices against my people and all people. So let the chips fall where they may. But I'm going to do what's right because it's right. And besides that, if I don't do it, they're going to get us all anyway. <laughs> They're going to disparage us all anyway. The church going to vote us out all anyway. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Esther then says in verse 16, go get all the Jews in Shushan and let's fast. And I will go to the king, which is against the law. Good trouble. And if I perish, I perish. But even if it costs me my life, I've got to do what I've got to do. And I've got to protect my people. Now notice, I wish I had time. Notice in the text that Esther does not mention prayer. She only mentions fasting. And there can be, however, no fasting without prayer. I wish somebody knew what I was talking about. For three days, she prays and she fasts. Let me put a kickstand here for a minute, just give you some little social advice. I believe many marriages would do better if more husbands and wives practice this principle of praying and fasting before approaching their spouses with big requests. Don't just go in and start talking. Pray first and then talk. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying. Lord, how should I say this? Lord, how should I approach this? In fact, I believe that that's good advice not just for married folk but single folk. Everybody pray before you talk. Chapter 5 begins. Esther goes in to see the king. She walks in. She's graceful. She's beautiful. She's charming. He looks at her. And his mind goes back 
to when he first saw her. He's got a smile on his face. And without hesitation, he extends the golden scepter. And then he says, Esther, O queen, what is your request? Because, baby, I'll give you half of the kingdom. Now, you know Esther must have been a bad mama jamma if he's going to give up half of the kingdom just by him looking at her. Are you hearing what I'm saying? But Esther doesn't want half of the kingdom. In fact, Esther doesn't want any of the kingdom. Esther just wants to save her people. Esther then asks the king for a banquet with her, him, and Haman in Haman's honor. The king agrees. At this banquet, the first banquet, the king asks Esther what she wants. But the timing isn't right. And that's what some of us have to realize sometimes, that our timing is not God's timing. God's timing is the best timing. So she replies, she says, oh, king, I just want another banquet tomorrow. I want another banquet tomorrow with you, with me, and Haman again in Haman's honor. But Esther, the king says, we're already at a banquet. We're already here together. Why do we have to do this again tomorrow? God's name is not mentioned, but God is moving. Haman is loving this. Two banquets on consecutive days in his honor. Haman's feeling good about himself. He heads home, but on the way out of the palace, he sees his rival. He sees his nemesis. He sees Mordecai. And just the sight of Mordecai gets his blood blow boiling. He's had enough of Mordecai. And so he decides that he's going to kill Mordecai. The Bible says he erects some gallows and decides he's going to hang and execute Mordecai the next day. Haman goes to sleep that night. He sleeps soundly because he's dreaming about how he's going to kill Mordecai the next day. Now back at the palace, and we're in chapter 6, the king is in his bed just like Haman is in his bed. But the difference between the king and Haman is Haman can sleep, but the king can't sleep. The king is tossing. The king is turning. And we don't know what the cause of the king's insomnia is, but the king then does a strange thing. The king tells his staff to go get the royal records and read them to him. And maybe he says do this because reading the royal records would help put him to sleep. Again, God's name is not mentioned, but God is moving. Because remember, friends, it was put in the royal records five years earlier how Mordecai was the one who exposed the assassination attempt on the king. When the king starts reading the royal records, he reads how Mordecai saved his life. He all of a sudden gets up and says, what? honor or dignity has been bestowed on Mordecai for saving my life. The king's servants answer, nothing. The king wants to change that now. The king wants to rectify that now. That now. God's name is not mentioned, but God is moving. The next morning, Haman wakes up. He gets dressed. He goes to the palace for work. And he goes to the king to ask the king to authorize the hanging of Mordecai that he's built these gallows for already. But before he can ask the king for permission to hang Mordecai, the king then asks him, what do I do for a man that I want to honor? Now Haman thinks the king is talking about him. But the king is really talking about Mordecai. So Haman answers and says, give him the best robe and let him ride on the king's horses. Again, God's name is not mentioned, but God is moving. 
The king then tells Haman, good idea. You go and hurry up and get the robe and the horse that you suggested and give it to Mordecai and leave nothing undone for what you have spoken. Haman, thinking it's for him, it's for his arch rival. Haman then leads the parade for the very man he wants to kill. Somebody knows late in the midnight hour, God will turn that thing around, that he will work it out in your favor. After the parade, Haman goes home to his wife and family. He thinks he's going to get some sympathy from them, but he doesn't get it. In fact, his wife and his friends tell him, you're the one that's going to die. The Jewish man you're trying to kill is being honored by the king. Haman goes back to the palace for a second banquet. He sits down at the king's table for another surprise. The king asks the queen Esther, Esther, what do you want? The timing is now right. The table is now set. At this second banquet, Esther doesn't hesitate. We're now in chapter 6. Esther responds, please, O king, spare me and spare my people. We've been sold to be destroyed and killed. The king looks at his wife and he says, who's threatening the queen's life? Who is he? Where is he? Now Haman is sitting there, sweating. His face has gone red because he doesn't know what's going to happen. And remember, he doesn't know that Esther is a Jew. Esther then looks him dead in the eye. And she says, the adversary and the enemy is the wicked Haman. The king is furious. He goes back in the recesses of his mind. And he remembers the decree Haman made him sign a couple of months earlier. How Haman had misrepresented the Jewish people as a political threat to the empire and how he had literally signed a decree into law that involved the murder of his own wife. All of a sudden, guards cover Haman's face. And guards take him out to the very gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai. They put him on the gallows that he built for somebody else and he dies. Today, let me remind somebody that too many of us are too busy setting traps for others, waiting for others to fall. And the same traps that we set for others are oftentimes the same traps that we fall in ourselves. You can be so busy turning people against somebody else. You better be careful that these same people don't turn on you. The lies we spread on others, the gossip we spread on others, the dirt we do to others will come back to get us. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. Be ye sure your sins will find you out. After Haman was hanged, Mordecai and Esther flourished in the Persian kingdom of King Ahasuerus. The king exalted Mordecai to second in command. And the king continued to love his queen against all odds. Esther and Mordecai, the Jews, had not just been spared, but they had also been elevated. God's name is never mentioned in the book of Esther, but God is always at work. From the narrowing down of the thousands of women in Persia to the 400 to the one Jew, Esther, for such a time as this. To Mordecai being in the right place at the right time 
where he could hear of the assassination attempt on the king for such a time as this. To the king being unable to sleep that night and deciding to read the royal record. And out of all the things that could have been read to him, what is read has to do with Mordecai being unrewarded for such a time as this. To Esther waiting the second time at the second banquet to tell the king of Haman's plan for such a time as this. Friends, God's name is not mentioned in the book of Esther, but God is everywhere. And these are not coincidences. These are not happenstances. This is not random. But I believe that I've got a witness watching right now who knows there is a designer, there is a coordinator, there is an architect, there is a power behind all of this. And that's a word for somebody. God has you right where you are for such a time as this. I don't care who you are today. It doesn't matter how somebody attempts to destroy you or destroy God's purposes. God has you are where you are for such a time as this. Somebody, you're trying to get out of the city of Huntsville. You may be living in Atlanta, New York. You may be in the Caribbean. You're trying to get out. But God has you where you are for such a time as this. Somebody's trying to quit their job. Somebody wants to give up. They say, I've had enough. But God won't let you get another job. Why? Because he has you where you are for such a time as this. And I want to remind and encourage someone today. Your enemies, the enemies of God can't succeed because God is in control. And so while you're going through your life, trying to dot I's and dot all the T's of your life, remember, thank you, Jesus, that there is still a divine architect who's in control. There is still a master designer who's on the throne. Our world may be chaotic, it may be disturbing, it may be distressing, it may be troubling, but God, God is still in control. And God has called you for such a time as this. So in the name of Jesus, go get some courage and fight in the face of danger and adversity. Don't be silent in the presence of evil. Oppressors come and go, but God is still in charge. He's still, as the old folks say, sits high, but he looks low. His timing is not your timing. He may not come when you want him, but he's always right on time. My soul is getting happy, but I'm going to stop because I can testify the goodness of God that his name in circum certain circumstances may not be mentioned, but you got to believe God is always there. I was a little boy growing up in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. My dad was the pastor of the church there, the Mount Olivet Seventh Day Adventist Church. 649 Northwest 15th Way, Fort Lauderdale, Florida, 33311. And I was a little boy in that church. So I cut my teeth and learned ministry in that church. On the first and fourth Sabbaths of every month, the saints were required. The adult choir, we call them the saints were required, they would sing. On the second and third Sabbaths of the month, the youth or the young adult choir, we called them the first love choir, they would sing. But as I was preaching and preparing for this sermon this week, I thought about being a little boy in that church, and I thought about on the first and the fourth Sabbaths of the month when the Saints Square Choir used to sing. And there was a lady by the name of Sonia Williams who used to play the piano and direct from the piano. And they used to sing a song. 
that has stuck with me in all of my life. Through tough times, through difficult times, they would sing this song. And as a little boy, I would remember the words to the song. Some of you may know it, some of you may not know it, but the song said, God is still on the throne. Within your bosom, you have a phone. Wherever you walk, you're not walking alone. Just remember that God is still on the throne. I don't know who you are. I don't know what you're dealing with today. I don't know if you're in Houston and, and you have no money and you have no water. I don't know if you're in Jackson and you have no money and you have no water. I don't know if you're in Huntsville and you feel like giving up. Somebody told me on the chat that somebody was thinking about committing suicide today. I don't know who you are. I don't know where you are. But God is still on the throne. And within your bosom, you have a phone. You can call him. Because wherever you walk, wherever life's journey takes you, you're not walking alone. Because as those seasoned saints used to say, just remember that God is still on the throne. For such a time as this. You may not see him. His name may not be mentioned, but he's still moving. Today, someone feels like giving up. Someone feels like throwing in the towel. Somebody feels like taking their life. Somebody feels like walking out on their marriage. Somebody feels like giving up on their children. Somebody today is watching who feels like giving up on school. But I'm here to tell you, he's still on the throne. And God has you where he has you for such a time as this. Go in your bosom. Get your phone. And remember as you walk, you're not walking alone because he's on the throne. And you got to call him. And he will hear when you pray. I'm done. I preach a lot of sermons, but this one moved on me this week because I can look at my life and I can look at the fact that there is an architect, there is a designer, there is a coordinator, there is a power that's at work in my life. And that same coordinator, that same architect, that same designer, that same power is at work in your life. And he has you where you, he has you such a time as this. Man, woman, boy, or girl, black, white, Asian, Hispanic, north, south, east, west, America, Africa, Asia, Australia, the West Indies, wherever you are, God has spoken to you today. And God wants you to surrender your life to him today. Because he has reminded you through this message that he's still on the throne. So what are you going to do? His golden scepter is extended to you. Are you going to come? Baptism, rebaptism, Bible study, special prayer, profession of your faith, transfer of your membership. You want to be a part of this commandment-keeping body. Go to the website of the Oakwood University Church, OUCSDA.org forward slash connect hyphen card and because God is still in control and he's orchestrating your life and he has called you for such a time as this I want to invite you to surrender your life to him right here and right now you're not in the building we're, we're not physically the same place but the Lord has allowed us virtually to be connected but most importantly his spirit has connected with you today and all you got to do is check that box check it check it. 
all things <laughs> are working out for your good. If he said he'll do it, you got to believe he's going to do it. Click that box today. You may not ever have another opportunity to do it. Well, you can yet do it. I invite you to do it today. Father, we thank you. Lord, we praise you. We bless your name. Thank you that you have us where you have us, that you've called us for such a time as this. And Father, though sometimes we may not see you, we have to be reminded every now and then, like we have been today, that you're still here, that you're still the designer. You're still the coordinator. You're still the architect. You're still the power that works in us. So Lord, I pray right now in the name of Jesus that your people surrender to your voice. Esther stood for her people. She didn't know what was going to happen, but in faith, she stood for her people. Because it was not just her people, it was your people, oh God. And so I pray today that you would protect your people and that as your people standing for you, oh Lord, that you would undergird them with the power of your Holy Spirit. Break chains today. Pull down strongholds today. And do it. Because, Lord, we're going to stand for you for such a time as this. Thank you for hearing this prayer. Thank you for answering this prayer. In the name of Jesus. Amen. And amen. May God bless you today. You're still alive. You still have a job. You still have a family because it's all according to God's plan. And he has you where he has you for such a time as this. You may not see him, but God is still moving. He's moving in your life and he's moving in the affairs of your life. May God continue to bless you. May God continue to be with you. Thank you for tuning in to the worship experience. The Oakwood University Church today, we pray, we hope that you have been blessed today. I want to remind you to stand by and stay by for our children's ministries, Oak Town with Pastor Raphael and his team. We solicit your prayers as we make the trip to Jackson, Mississippi to deliver water. And then on Wednesday, we, we are going to have our food giveaway. And we want to make sure those that would like to be a part of that, you can be. You can support all of these community initiatives. You know how to do that, and so feel free to do that as well. And then be back next Sabbath with us. Sabbath school at 1030 with Dr. Toussaint Williams, the Divine Worship Experience at 11. The Oakwood University aliens will sing. We have a special honoree, special presentation next week. Got to be here to see it. And then we have another message from the Word of God just for you.